Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. Today on the show, we have my friend Amy Minkley, who I recently met at the Economy Conference. And Amy's story has a little bit of everything. I, I say that fairly often, and it almost sounds trite, but this is the example of literally the story having everything. And just the short list of topics that we could potentially talk about are leaving a high paying job, geo arbitrage, teaching in Japan, mini retirements, international teaching, slow travel, gap years, Bali, one more year syndrome, finding Phi, and then going to every Phi in person event you could possibly find, breaking contracts, asking for jobs back, scarcity mindset, online teaching with kids in California. I mean, literally, we could have probably five to 10 episodes here with Amy. So this might be part one of N, but I think you're absolutely going to love Amy Minkley. Welcome to Choose a Fi. Thanks, Brad. I'm super excited to be here. Oh, this is going to be great, Amy. And yeah, like I said, I met you at Economy. We became fast friends and we knew we had to do this episode, but more importantly, yeah, it was just so wonderful to meet you. And you helped me with the one more year syndrome breakout group, which wound up being a rousing success, though. I think we were a little worried about it at the beginning because what's so nice about these FI events, and I think the power of in-person events, whether they're choose a FI local meetup groups to Camp FIs, to Economies, to Chautauqua, to your FI Freedom Retreat, which is going to happen later this year, is people just become these fast friends, right? And we have so much in common. And it really is about meeting other people there, meeting friends, as opposed to listening to a speaker necessarily. And I think you and I realized that right away, just in that very one hour presentation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like, you know, when we have the same values as far as money, so many other things fall into place. And, you know, we think outside the box, people in the fire movement, you know, we are living intentionally. We want to design our life and really utilize our time and our energy to the best of our ability. And so I just find that when I go to these fire events, I am fast friends with people and I loved meeting you and you've been my hero for a long time. So that was, that was awesome. I mean, honestly, this movement has made a huge impact on my life. And so it was so cool to meet people at Economy and at all the camp fives I've gone to and fin talks and everything. But yeah, I definitely think, you know, it leads to really deep friendships and long lasting friendships. Yeah, it's it is remarkable. There's something about that that like you said, when you share the same values and you're all there for the same reason, it's not just, hey, we're looking to soak up information, right? As if we're trying to get taught. We're going there with an open mind to meet people maybe for the first time ever that are like us, right? And I like to say we are these little islands unto ourselves. And, and that's what it's felt like for a very long time, maybe years ago, frankly, because now the FI movement is so widespread across the globe that I know we have hundreds, 300 plus Choose of I local groups in hundreds of cities. I know you all across Asia have been meeting with people and it is remarkable to see it spread from when I found FI in 2012, 2013, it, was, it just seemed like a handful of us to now it's quite literally millions of people across the globe. Yeah, it's really exciting. And it's, it's fun to, for me also to dive into these other FI communities and other parts of the world. You know, I'm headed to Brisbane in July and I'm, I'm going to meet up with the Choose a FI group and I've been connecting nice. with the Choose a FI Australia, David, uh, leader there and just getting on some of these Facebook groups and connecting with other communities. It's so cool to be able to, you know, access that when we travel as well, to have instant friends in different cities and just say, hey, I'm coming here. Anybody want to meet up for a picnic or, you know, go out for a beer or something? So I am so grateful. It's amazing. You know, I, I found the FIRE movement during a time where I was feeling very isolated during the pandemic and reading the books and listening to the podcast was so helpful at that time. But to go to in-person events and meet people, there is something so special about that. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think you have an interesting story as to how you found FI and then choose a FI in a very serendipitous way, right? Yes. So I was working in Bangkok at the time and I was going through, I had taken a sabbatical year that turns into two sabbatical years <laughs> and I had lived an amazing life in Bali and I've kind of saw my best life. And then I turned my back on it because I was worried about not making money. And so I went to Bangkok for a job and I was not very happy. 
And I really struggled with depression during that time. And a lot of it, I was waking up in the morning at three, you know, just with anxiety regularly and not sleeping, sleep deprived. My partner, who I hadn't been with that long, but I moved him to Bangkok with me. And he's like, who are you? You are, <laughs> you're a different person. But during that dark period, I went online late at night and one of these anxious nights where I'm thinking about like, I'm not liking my life here. I need to know how much I need to retire. I looked online. I found a video of Pete and I went in the next day to school. I was so excited. And I told one of my friends, you know, have you heard of this fire movement? You know, and she said, you know, I know someone who's in the fire movement. Actually, I worked with him in Santiago and he's coming to Bangkok next week. You should meet him. And, you know, we just got busy. I didn't know much about, I, I just discovered the fire movement. And then I bumped into your brother in the parking lot of my school. <laughs> in Bangkok. In Bangkok. And, you know, I was, I had just watched one video of Pete. And so he said, well, you know, you should check out my brother's podcast. It's called Choose If I. And so I remember going up to my apartment, writing it down. And, and that day, like downloading the episodes. And then I just went on a deep dive. And it really saved me because that was a really dark period of my life. So I, you know, I would listen to it as I would jog around the lake. And it was, it gave me a sense of hope to really start to understand how much money do I need to retire and to build the foundation of the knowledge and to realize that actually I'm better off than I think I am because I had been an aggressive saver for almost two decades already. So, um, you know, I'm grateful to the Choose of I podcast because it really made a difference in my journey. It was really the first resource that I tapped into in the fire community. Wow. That is amazing. That is truly amazing. I'm glad. I'm glad, obviously, it could provide support to you. And, and yeah, it's a remarkable thing. I think, obviously, we are a conduit for this message, right? But like you said, it's, there's hope and there's some, maybe for that first time, there's some level of certainty. And I think that to me is what is so beautiful about FI, right? Is it changes it from it being retirement or just money in general from this very nebulous thing where you listen to the doom and gloom to, like you're saying, the stress and anxiety, which I know that's impacted me. And I don't think, frankly, I've talked about this that often, but I've talked so many times about my failed real estate speculation. But I mean, Amy, I lost hundreds of hours of sleep hundreds over a decade long period of just beating myself up. How could you be so stupid? All of these things playing in my head. And I think the beautiful thing is once I internalized Phi and understood that, okay, look, I've made this mistake in my case, but I can still have a 50% savings rate. I can still have a 60%, a whatever it may be. And again, with the certainty of, oh, you mean this doesn't mean I'm ruined or I'm a bad person. I still control what I can control, which are my yearly expenses. And then therefore, I know what my fine number is. And that just, once I internalize that, and Amy, it took a long time, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, me too, me too. Yeah. <laughs> it took a damn long time. But man, once you get that moment, it is, it's freeing. It truly is. Yeah. Yeah. It took me a long time too. And it took really ingesting all this knowledge and then doing work around money mindset too. But you know, it's both pieces, like knowing the nuts and bolts of money. And then also looking at what are my subconscious beliefs, you know, that no matter how much I understand the 25 times rule or 4% rule, you know, I know no matter how much I know that I really have to look at my beliefs and really get comfortable. And that's why one more year syndrome was a thing, you know, and I hit that wall of fear. Definitely. Yeah. So it sounds like, and, and yeah, I definitely want to talk about this uh, one more year because as, as we said, we presented on that in, in, a, in an interesting way. And, and you have such a personal and visceral story of that, but it really comes back maybe rewinding 20, 30 years, right? To when you were a kid and that where that scarcity mindset comes from. And you saying to be secure, you felt like you must work hard and save money. And when that's imprinted on you at such a young age, darn, is it, is it hard to get rid of that, right? Even when you are in, by any definition, a comfortable position, well on your path to five, maybe at five. But when you have that mindset, like you said, the nuts and bolts, that's the easy part at the end of the day, once you learn it. But goodness, to unwind these money mindsets, that's the real rub here. Yeah, it is. I mean, I didn't really see it my whole life, but I had that belief, you know, I must work hard and I must save money. And also money could disappear at any moment. You know, that's a, a lesson I learned at 12. Um, 
you know, my, my family had money and then my dad left the family and suddenly overnight we didn't have money. And I saw my mom stressing about money and we had to sell our family home. We had to move to a different state. I suddenly felt like the poor kid in school and I really struggled with confidence and worthiness issues. And so having money disappear overnight and then hearing my mom talking about her money fears really imprinted me to, you know, I can't depend also on a man for money. You know, I I also had a little bit of distrust there. And I, as a woman, I need to be able to support myself and be safe and save money. And I I learned, you know, in, in high school, how to buy my first car. I worked two jobs, you know, pay for college, working two jobs, living as a, you know, crappy student apartments, working as an (laughs) RA, going to state school, all of those things, you know, I was pulling all the levers to get through school, pay my rent, buy my books, all of those things. And it was great. They were great lessons. I learned how to budget at an early age, but that blessing was also a curse because, you know, it's hard to turn off that mentality that served me in the beginning, but then no longer served me later. Yeah. I think that's, uh, it's so interesting how our minds work, right? Like I know I've mentioned before on the podcast that I've always been prone to anxiety and, and really like what I've hit on is it's your brain essentially creating future fictions and trying to safeguard against those future fictions and making you miserable in the moment. So it's trying so hard to keep you safe, but it's actually making you miserable in the moment, which is it, it just isn't serving you, obviously. And, and I think what you're talking about here is is this, if I could, like this anxiety about money in that like the script is always there. That worry from when you were a little kid, when you were 12 years old of this could go away at any moment. So how do you respond to that? You grasp onto it as hard as you can. Or to be secure, I have to save money. That's what is going to keep me safe. Again, what I'm talking about with the anxiety is what is our brain doing? What is our brain's probably foremost goal is to keep ourselves safe. And goodness, it's hard, even when you make that realization, to then somehow unwind it. And and I'm curious. So, I mean, this was obviously a multi decade thing. Yes. (laughs) Like, how on earth? And you were a super saver. I'm like, again, for anybody thinking otherwise, like, you had the money stuff down, but the mindset was still stuck from when you were a little girl. Yes. So, I mean, it started early. I remember, you know, my first job, pulling out my calculator, calculating mm-hmm. 425 an hour. How many hours can I work? Can I do overtime? And I had two jobs in high school and, you know, to buy that first car and then college as well, you know, I would debate every spending decision. Um, and I got out debt free in college. It took me five years, but, you know, I, I, I felt like I was winning. Yeah. I had learned as a super saver how to be successful. And those same strategies 20 years later were, you know, almost the death of me, really. I mean, I was running myself into the ground. But yeah, all those years international school teaching, you know, I was calculating my monthly savings rate, figuring out my monthly net worth, pouring over the spreadsheets month after month. And, you know, not, I mean, I did a lot of international travel and I did, it's not that I was totally in deprivation, but I traveled budget because that's just who I am. But I didn't feel secure you know, that there could have been a lot more joy during those years, even though I still did have a lot of adventures, I could have been more relaxed along the way and had more just day-to-day peace. Yeah. What eventually changed? And I know obviously so much has changed in the last couple of years and and finding Phi certainly seems to have, like you said, this was a, a dark time in 2019 amidst COVID and amidst this moving. And, and of course, we're jumping ahead a, a, quite a bit here. But was finding Phi a real turning point with this money mindset or like what was actually that lightning bolt moment for the money mindset shift? I think it was a a gradual process. I don't know that there was just one moment, but it was first, I think, living in Bali before all my international school years in Singapore and Delhi. And I had lived in Japan, too, and I had overworked a lot of years. And so I took a sabbatical year that turned into and I had my best life there. And I really turned my back on it for money. And really, I had a good nest egg already, but I didn't think it was enough and I didn't know how much I needed. And um, moving to Bangkok with my partner and then him seeing like how I changed overnight to be this anxious, unhappy person. And it was having an impact on our relationship. And I had been single because I, after my dad left, I really hadn't trusted men. And I kind of kept myself guarded for a lot of years. And I had this also this belief about, you know, I needed to be strong and independent was another one of my subconscious beliefs that I didn't see. 
And, um, you know, in Bali, I kind of healed that and I healed my relationship to my father. He's a wonderful man. You know, now we're much closer, but I had been single from 2002 to 2018, 16 years. And I had been in this pattern of overworking to feel worthy and saving to feel safe, you know, enjoying my job to a certain degree, but lonely and tired and overworked. And and I took a sabbatical year that turned into two and I met my partner in Bali and then I moved him to Bangkok. And then I was putting my relationship on the line because, you know, I didn't have time for him. I didn't have time to to spend with him. I was just overworking again. And yeah, it and then it was learning the financial principles that helped me. And I really got clear about the impact on my health, on my relationship, on my peace of mind. And then also learning, you know, how much do I actually need? And then looking, working in, doing some of that fear setting, digging into some of my subconscious beliefs was helpful. And then actually going through the process of preparing to leave for my job and not leaving and leaving and not leaving and going through that process, I think was part of the process as well. And then my dad's health was part of the, so there were several different things yeah. that came together at the same time that really kind of helped burn that off. And, and I wouldn't say it's fully burned off because, you know, it's still a work in progress, but it helped me choose a different path. Yeah. It's amazing how, how this decision to move to Bangkok to take a job again. So it sounds like if, I, if I'm putting the pieces together, you were in Bali and that's where you met your partner and you were on a sabbatical gap year and you were, <laughs> and I'm jokingly saying Bali, Amy, right? Yes. And then mm-hmm. it's okay because those money scripts kick in and, oh, I can save what, 70, 80, $90,000 a year at this job in Bangkok. I have to do it. Yeah. No, I saw the job and I knew that the schools often, you know, they pay for your housing. My place was furnished. You know, they pay for your flights over and ship you over with all your stuff. And I worked these jobs before so that I knew that when I saw the salary, I knew I could save. And I and I had a little bit of side income coming in from real estate, just a note, not that I own a house, but a, a real estate note. And so I knew, you know, I could really live on my real estate note and I could save my full salary, which was 90,000. So I was really basically saving 90% of all the money that I had coming in, just living on that, that note. So when I saw that offer and I was living in Bali, I thought, I have to do that. You know, I put it in my compound interest calculator. I figured <laughs> out how the much- spreadsheet. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, I went only really for the money and I fell flat on my face. I thought I would be, you know, I, I could uh, be more Zen. I'd lived in Bali for two years and I would be bringing a lot of the learnings that I had had in Bali. And I did not do well. <laughs> I, did, <laughs> I uh, just went back into old patterns. Yeah. Goodness, it's hard not to, but right. Like you said, it, I think you became aware both internally and also it sounds like your partner and it caused this, these issues really fairly quickly because again, he's seeing someone that he didn't previously see in Bali and yeah, then these, these scripts kick in. I know you said previously that, so you were in Bangkok and then I guess these international schools, you have a contract, but then you decided to break the contract, right? Yeah. I mean, I was, when I first got there, I was, you know, I was going through a lot of imposter syndrome. So I was working hard just to, you know, feel like I belonged there. You know, anytime I, for me, at least when I started a new job, I feel like I've got to build my reputation. And I was quite miserable in the beginning because I was especially overworking at that time. But I, you know, they make you decide or they don't make you, but that you have to decide really early. I think that deadline's November 1st, even though you just started teaching in August. So it's just a few months. And I signed a contract to teach another year, even though I was very unhappy there. And then I went away for Christmas break and I just really got some quiet time. And I thought, I cannot work another year. And so I went in and I knew it was going to kind of blacklist me for international schools because it's a small community. So, you know, you shouldn't break contract. But I went in after the Christmas holiday and just said, you know, for my own mental well-being, I do not want to renew my contract next year. And so, you know, I was not going to work. I was only going to work the one year, which is initially what I had contracted for. But then six months later, I decided <laughs> I need to work again. And so I went in and, <laughs> oh, you yeah. know, had the, I and my principal give me the job back. And so I worked a second year. So it was really, you know, really one more year syndrome. Wow. You actually did work the second year. 
I did. Oh I my did. goodness, I didn't realize that. So I went through this whole, you know, period of really making it complicated for myself. And, and it was embarrassing, you know, to say yes to a contract and then break contract and then go back in and say, I'd like my job again. <laughs> but I think I kind of needed to do that to really get over, you know, caring so much what other people think, you know, and just be true to myself. And, and actually, when I did go in and, and ask for my job back, that was an authentic decision, you know, because the job did get better and I did kind of realize a better way to balance it. And I am glad I did that second year, but you know, it, it was good to walk through that quitting and then asking for my job back and, you know, facing that embarrassment that I felt. Yeah. And like you said, sometimes, I mean, you really can grow by leaning into that. And I think so many of us just try to be so proud, right? Like, oh, we could never change our mind or lose face or whatever verbiage you want to put in there. But also, like I said, changing your mind. And I think I, I talked about this on a recent episode where it's like flip-flopping has become maligned in uh, certainly in politics and such. But I mean, to me, changing our minds based on new information is what intelligent people do, right? And in your case, you wanted to break your contract because at that point you were miserable, but then it sounds like it got dramatically better. And you, from a place of strength, were able to say, I actually want to work this extra year. That's what I'm hearing, at least. And, and you made that decision not because, oh, you were worried about what people would think, because you already did the hard part, right? You already right. did the, <laughs> the part where you might be embarrassed. And now it's like, oh, I really like this. I'm going to stay here another year. I mean, that's, that's a really good thing. And that's, I mean, goodness, both sides of that <laughs> must have been really hard. Yeah. I mean, I think the first year teaching any place, because the curriculum's new in each school that I teach at, you know, it's always hard that first year, you know, you're making everything from scratch. I mean, you have a team, but a lot of it's from scratch. And, and also the, the pandemic hit. And then suddenly I was teaching online and it was hard for a lot of teachers, but in Bangkok, it actually, it was easier for me. Our classes got shorter. I went away during one break and then they closed down the school and we could teach, I could teach from an island, which was pretty oh, nice. Was so bad. yeah, I mean, it wasn't good for the kids and it was, I wouldn't have wished it that way, but it actually helped bring me out of that period of depression and helped me learn how to balance my life a bit more. Nice. Yeah. I want to, uh, well, first, since we're talking about international teaching, Actually, since you mentioned my brother, he was on episode 109 of Chooseify. So for anybody interested in international teaching, him and we had another guy, Rob, on the show at, on that episode, they both talked about the value of international teaching. And I know, obviously, it's worked amazingly well on your path to Fi. It worked remarkably well for my brother. And really, the salaries are, I'm just astonished. Like you said, very much in passing, like, Many of these schools pay for your living. They pay for flights to and from the U.S. once or twice a year. They, there's all of these extra things. I just I could not stop having like my mind just like boggled by all of the benefits. And then the actual base salary for my brother. I, I mean, don't quote me, obviously, but I, I think it was something like 1.8 times or almost double what the local school here in Virginia was paying him. So it was an absolute no brainer. And not to mention, it's this amazing adventure you're meeting other people that are of adventurous spirit. Many people, they, there's these new cohort of, uh, hey, all, these are all the first year teachers. And they're coming from many from the US, but from across the world. And you have 5, 10, 20 new people that are all in this together. And it, it almost feels like going back to like freshman year of college, when, yes. right? Like who are the people you remember from college? It's mostly the people on your floor of your dorm freshman year. Yeah. Yeah. I first went abroad in 2001 and that was exactly this scenario. You know, I was just out of college and I actually worked not at an international school, but the Japanese government flew us over to Japan to teach at Japanese high schools. And, you know, they paid my rent and the salary wasn't super high to teach ESL, but I was saving $5,000 a year. So I was there four years. I saved $20,000. This was 20 years ago. So it wasn't huge savings, but I had the time of my life. And, you know, my closest friends are still those friends that I met during that period. And that opened my eyes, you know, because I grew up in rural Texas. And then suddenly I'm, you know, I just was traveling to Thailand on my holidays. And <laughs> I loved Japan and the Japanese people. And I thought I'd stay a year or two. And then I stayed four. And then I learned about international school teaching, you know, and I figured out that I could save even more at international schools. And as you said, yeah, the benefits are amazing. I mean, I basically house hacked my whole time in Singapore and in India. So that's a huge savings as well. 
like the school in Singapore, the school paid for my accommodation, but I rented out my extra room. And so then that, <laughs> so you that, doubled down on it. That's I amazing. doubled. I mean, just from this scarcity mindset from childhood, you know, I was thinking like, how can I save and maximize? And I was the only teacher in my school who did that. But I, yeah, I shared my place for all six years in Singapore. I, I had someone living with me. And then in India, the school actually gave you the option to live with another teacher if you wanted to. And then they paid us each $10,000 a year. So I did that. And my roommate was awesome. I mean, she was one of my best friends. And we had a four bedroom, four bath place with marble floors, really big. So it was nice to be able to house hack essentially for 10 years and not only have rent free, but somehow benefit also beyond that. Right. That's so cool. Yeah. I think for the many, many teachers out there listening to this podcast, if you're looking for an adventure, these international schools can be a, a real, real way to go about that. So go back and listen to episode 109. I think that's, that's a good way. But Amy, do you have any other like just super quick hit tips on like how somebody could even get the ball rolling? Like what would be the first step someone would want to take if they were thinking about international teaching? Yeah, I would uh, recommend that they go to a search associates job fair. And there's a couple of different job fairs, but that's kind of the biggest one. And I think there's one in Boston every year. There's one in Bangkok every year. There's several all, all throughout the world, but I think the Boston one's the main one in the U.S. Okay. Yeah. And beyond just international school teachers, I'd recommend listeners, you know, if they are interested in working abroad, and if that is something that they can look into for their own profession, you know, it may be that there is an expat contract somewhere in the world that would pay better, you know, even if you're not a teacher. So, you know, I met a lot of cool people um, in India working at the UN or embassies or, you know, aid organizations and Singapore, a lot of finance people. So it's worth looking into if it's something that interests your listener, like, could this job be abroad? Or could I find a way for my company to send me abroad or work for another company? Because those expat packages can be very nice. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I know my brother-in-law has a finance job at a massive corporation and, and he does that. They've gone abroad multiple times to Venezuela, to South Africa, to England and gone for a couple of years at a time. It's just so cool. And then not to mention nowadays with work from home and remote working, well, you're not really geolocated anymore. It doesn't, it truly doesn't matter. So maybe you could make your own travel abroad plan in the confines of your current job. Obviously, this is something you have to have to do research on. But I think what you're painting the picture of is just start thinking about it. Start asking, how can you do this? This is an adventure. And it's like you said, being true to yourself. And I, I do want to get back to that because I think being true to yourself for you ultimately took you back to Bali. And that's where your life predominantly is now. But before we get there, you said something very much in passing that I'd heard one other time, but I, I don't know if it's the same thing we're talking about here, but you said fear setting. I'd love if you could dive into that because I, I suspect that piqued the interest of a bunch of people. Yeah, I think for so much of my life, I've been dominated by what if this happens? What if that happens? And just imagining all the worst case scenarios and you know, actually sitting down and allowing myself to go into that fear and journaling through that process and, you know, just the same thing with when I quit my job, you know, what if the market crashed and inflation goes really sky high and I have a health issue and my partner has a health issue and, you know, what if all of these things happened and what if they all happened at the same time, you know, and allowing myself <laughs> to kind of sit in that. Yeah. You know, because it's highly unlikely that all of those things would happen at the same time. <laughs> but what if they did? You know, what would I do? You know, now that I don't work at international schools anymore, well, I would probably maybe go back and get another international school job again, which I could do. You know, I have the community, I have the network, and I do like teaching. And I did finally figure out how to balance it more at the end of Bangkok. I could do that, or I could build a business, or I could find I could find ways to support myself. I have the skills, I have the network, you know, I have the motivation to do that. And then it's fun to allow myself, like once I've done that fear setting and really allow myself to journal through that and think through all the worst case scenarios to think about what if it's actually better than I imagined? Of course, I could handle one or two things bad going wrong, but what if it's better than I could envision? And opening myself up to possibility and opportunity. And often I find, you know, all the things I fear never happen. And in fact, it turns out better than what I imagined. So it's allowing myself to sit with that discomfort and then see the other side of it too. Yeah, that is beautiful. And it's so, 
it's so important. And I think a lot of us aren't even aware of, of this as a, a concept, but I know I've heard it also in the realm of Stoic philosophy where these fear setting of, hey, what is the worst that could happen? And it's something to the effect of, I'm paraphrasing horribly here, but like Marcus Aurelius, the most powerful person in the world and imagining himself as, okay, if I've lost everything, what would it actually be like? What would it be like to walk the streets and, and just actually picturing yourself? And again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing yeah. <laughs> almost certainly incorrectly there, but, but that's the concept of what if that thing that I fear the worst actually isn't all that bad? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I mean, Seneca talks about this too, you know, about negative visualizations. And, you know, the Stoic philosophers also talk about really visualizing, you know, losing, like you said, like losing everything and even your own death you know, visualizing your own death and doing, I mean, I did a lot of death meditations in, in the past too, but there is something about that that kind of brings into your awareness, like what you have to be grateful for. Yes. And the things that we just, they fade into the background of our lives of abundance. And you're not grateful really on a conscious level of all the remarkable things you have in your life. Most of us aren't, right? I mean, who is consciously grateful for the hundreds, thousands of conveniences and remarkable advances that we benefit from every single day. You think about if you could be placed at any time in human history, you would be placed now, almost undoubtedly. Right. And yet, when you turn on the news, it's doom and gloom. People thinking the world's going to end, complaining about the Fed and taxes and all this other nonsense. Like, But you, you do the look outside test, which is kind of something I've coined. Like, You look outside and the world is pretty wonderful. You look through your regular day, the world is pretty wonderful for most of us, right? That's not to say there's not suffering. That's not to say there's not bad things going on in the world. I'm not a fool. I'm not naive. But for the vast majority of us, this is quite literally the best time in human history to be living. Hard stop, end of story, no question about it. And yet we lose sight of that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I feel like, you know, there is so much value in actually contemplating the gratitude, but also contemplating like the end of our life, you know, and I know that sounds scary to some people, but like when we contemplate the end of our life, it helps us to get really clear about our values. You think about Doc G, right? And earn and invest. And his work as a hospice doctor and talking to people who are dying. And I just love hearing, you know, all of his wisdom about, you know, what do people really reflect on and value at the end of their life? And if I can think about that now and then live more intentionally, I am really living with more gratitude, like you said, and looking outside and appreciating all the things that I have, I have in my life. It is a wonderful time to be alive. Yeah. And then even kind of bringing it back to the micro of phi, which is, okay, again, using the same concept of the fear setting, what's the worst that would happen? And I, I'm going to go two for two on my paraphrasing horribly here and, and hopefully remembering who said this, but I believe it was Joel from Phi 180 way back in 2017 on our podcast. And he talked about what's the absolute worst thing that could happen if you reach Phi or you proclaim that you've reached Phi and you even stop working, right? You're bringing in no income and things go horribly wrong. And I'm, I'm using that dripping with sarcasm in air quotes, horribly wrong. Well, you go back to work. And as, as he said, paraphrase, your worst case scenario is everybody else's every day. Right. Right. So that's if it goes horribly awry. And even in that ridiculous scenario that is so unlikely, you still are so much better off than you would have been had you not pursued financial independence, because undoubtedly, like things going catastrophically wrong still means you're probably at 80% of your FI number or 90%. It just, like That's what's so silly about this is you're still wildly wealthy in that scenario. You have so much power and autonomy that you simply would not have had if you were living paycheck to paycheck all those years, right? So it is unquestionably the right path. And this is what I say to people who ask me, is five for everybody? I think my answer clearly is yes, with the caveat that I, again, am not naive enough to say that it is not any harder for someone making twenty or $30,000 a year than someone making a million dollars a year. Obviously, it's easier for somebody making a million dollars a year. But I think all of us, no matter who we are, where we are, can benefit from pursuing financial independence because any little bit of power that we can reclaim in our lives by saving money, by not having, like Amy, we're talking about, both of us have experienced significant stress because of finances. 
obviously in different ways, but we've all experienced it in different ways. And to any stress mitigation of having that first $500 saved up, $1,000 saved up, your life is dramatically better. And I think that it's very easy to lose sight of these things because we think only about what's that perfect success story with the perfect 4% safe withdrawal and nothing went wrong. And, but, but that's not real life. It just isn't, but yet you're still a success. And I think that's what I'd love for us to each internalize in our own heads and to get across to the audience and the community at large is you start accruing benefit on your path to financial independence on day one. Yeah, you do. You have so many more choices. You know, the minute you pay off your debt, you have a lot more options. The minute you have your emergency funds saved up, more options. By the time you've got your first hundred thousand, you know, more options. So it is it's nice to have these little milestones along the path to buy. And all along the way, you are buying yourself more choices and more freedom. So, you know, I just encourage listeners to no matter where they are in their journey, you know, for listeners who feel like, you know, and I know I have friends like this and people in my family like this who feel like I didn't start, I waited too late. And they have this story about that. But no matter where you are, starting today, just letting that go and looking at what can I do now? And you can't control what happened in the past, but you can change your future and what that looks like. And so, you know, I'm excited because I I feel like this community is about so much more than money. It's about time freedom and, you know, life freedom and optimization and really living our our one life well. Oh, I love that. Living our one life well. That is, uh, man. I mean, it sounds trite. No, it doesn't sound trite, Amy. You know, I guess I've, I feel like I've lived that, you know, because for most of my life and what I realized in that period of time when I was in Bangkok and having a lot of depression and anxiety, and I, I uh, started listening to Choose If I, and then I learned about your money or your life. And that book was a kind of an aha moment for me because I realized my whole life I've been choosing money. I haven't been choosing my life. You know, if someone actually held a gun to my head and asked me that question, your money or your life, I would choose my life. But obviously I'd never, I'd never really done that in a lot of ways. So really, when we think about that one life and allow ourselves to kind of reflect on how do I want to live it, you know, and, and imagine that um, as if we're going back to what we we're talking about earlier, you know, it is shorter than we realize. And I think as we age, we realize like, okay, you know, and I'm seeing my parents age right now. Um, my dad just turned 83. So, you know, it's very fresh to me about living that one life intentionally. Yeah. And you talk about making that choice, your money or your life. And while it sounds like for many years, because of this scarcity mindset, you chose money. From what I'm hearing, it sounds like you chose your life recently. And that goes back to the being true to yourself and ultimately ending back in Bali. And it's an amazing thing to see to see that change, right? To see that dramatic shift and that realization that I was doing this for money. Even the leaving Bali, right? You <laughs> left this place yeah. that you love so much to go to Bangkok, to break a contract, to finish it out, to all this <laughs> stuff, <laughs> and then to go back. And uh, it's it's wild. And I, I'd love to hear you talk about, maybe just about Bali, about being true to yourself, about how you knew that was the place for you. Yeah, I didn't really initially know that it was the place for me. You know, I'd been there a dozen times. You know, I lived in Singapore for six years. And even when I was living in Japan, I used to go down there. So I'd been there a lot as a tourist and I had only seen the touristy things. And, you know, I was going to take that sabbatical year. I left India in 2017 and I was just passing through Bali and I was going to do this transformational course and it was only 10 days long. And that's really where I healed my relationship with my father and realized that I was ready to call in a partner. And I met my partner four days later, which was wild. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so it's funny how you can be single for 16 years and then, you know, call in a partner pretty quickly after. So yeah, it was once I decided to stay there and really sunk into the community of people that live there, the entrepreneurs, uh, the digital nomads, the people who are there long term. And I stopped doing kind of the touristy things. And I really found the community. I really realized I don't want to travel fast anymore. And, you know, I was going to go to Africa and see the whole continent and, you know, check places off my list. And really what I love is a routine and I love community and I love deep conversations and that's hard to do on the road. And so I ended up staying and one year turned into two and I was super happy there. And so when, you know, 
after uh, I went back to Bangkok, I was ready to go back. And my partner and I, he's lived there for many years and he was also fired, but didn't know what fire was. So we have a beautiful life, you know, place in the rice fields, little ducks waddling through, (laughs) cranes flying across the rice fields. And I I have a luxurious life. Like it's very affordable. I go to yoga every day. I go to lots of classes. I have lots of friends around me and a lot of really inspiring people. So it's, yeah, there's a lot of professional and personal growth opportunities every day. So I feel like, you know, my day is really full and it feels really meaningful. And there's a lot of people with a flexible schedule. So I don't feel lonely. Whereas I think maybe if I was fired in some suburb in the US, I might feel like everybody's working around me. (laughs) So I love that. I love that there's a lot of people that have time. And I got the idea, you know, when I was in Bangkok, of because I knew I loved Bali and I was hearing about, I was listening to Choose a Buy and hearing about economy and camp buy and all of those things. And so, you know, during that time in Bangkok, I got the idea of, I want to hold an, a fire event on this side of the world. Asia is my home. And I want to create some kind of event for people who live over here, or people who want to come over here and visit. So Bali's been a special place for me for a while, but I didn't always know how special it was until I experienced the community there. Yeah. And maybe until after you left, right? Like you said, this was such a special place for me. And then it's dot, dot, dot. And then I left for two years. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes. But then, right. Obviously that's, uh, I mean, you found your way back and that's a wonderful thing. And yeah, it's just, it's an interesting observation, certainly like you're saying of, yeah, it's one thing to be fi in some random suburb in the U S like me, where, Everybody else is working to a large degree, but it sounds like a really intentional community of people who have maybe come from all across the globe, including, I assume, local Balinese people who have formed this really vibrant community. And, and it, it's obvious. You can hear it in your voice, just the vibrancy of, A, the community and what it means to you. Yeah, I mean... You know, I'm an introvert, but when I get around people that are like-minded and that are really inspiring, I could sit and talk for hours and listen to other people and learn from them. And that's what I felt both with the FIRE community, because I found my tribe in the U.S. with this community. I love it. And I went to eight FIRE events and uh, I've got (laughs) Camp Mustache at the end of the month. So, um, you know, that'll be my ninth. But I've been to a lot of FIRE events in the U.S. And my tribe, you know, is in Bali too. And I feel like it's a very similar kind of tribe, you know, that people who are living intentionally, they've chosen kind of a non-traditional path, thinking about how do I really value and how do I align my life with those values? And they're very driven, inspiring, motivated people. And so I feel like I learn a lot from them. And so I I love the community in Bali as well. Yeah, that's cool. And and like you, you kind of mentioned here, and I mentioned at the beginning is you have started your own Phi event. So it's the Phi Freedom Retreat, but right, it's at Phi Freedom Retreats, plural, retreats.com. And uh, you sold this thing out instantly. So it, we're not talking about this to sell tickets by any means. Like it was astonishing how fast it sold out. I know I mentioned in my Phi Weekly newsletter, and you're like, oh, it had already sold out long before then, which is amazing. And it just shows really the desire for these type of meetups all across the globe. Because at least from what I recollect you telling me, it wasn't a lot of Americans who signed up. It was people from Australia and Asia and again, all across the globe. And that's just such a cool thing. And nothing like that has existed before. Obviously, the Chautauqua event is probably the most similar to what you're creating. But I know the majority of people who attended Chautauqua, at least in my experience, were American. And of course, nothing wrong with that, clearly. But it's really neat that you've created something that that there was such a desire for. Did you know there was such a desire for it? Was it like a pleasant surprise when it sold out essentially instantly? Yeah, no, I didn't fully know. And you know, it's hard to know in the beginning, right? I just I know that I love Bali, and I want to bring people here and expose them because I felt like Bali opened my eyes, you know, I loved international school teaching. But then when I went to Bali and stayed there and saw the expats living there, it opened my eyes to a whole new world and a whole new possibility. So, you know, I wanted to bring people to Bali and show them that life. And I do feel like there's something special about going international that opens a new realm of what what could be created, you know, and to meet people who are doing really cool things in the world. So I, I wanted to bring people to Bali, but I didn't really know, you know, if it was going to be something that people would be that interested in. And so I felt really touched and I felt so supported by this community. And, you know, again and again, and I, like you said earlier, there is something about an in-person event and I have gained so much 
from these in-person events because the community has sat down and talked to me about my money fears, logged on to Vanguard with me, looked at my asset <laughs> allocation, looked at my spreadsheet and my numbers. You know, people have shown up for me again and again. And then when I put on this event, I'm just, I feel so supported. And it, I, I do feel like in life, when you're choosing something that's really aligned with your values and your where your heart is calling you, then life does find a way to show up and support you and the right people show up. So I, I do feel really honored that so many people want to come and I don't take it lightly, you know, that they're all going to fly to Bali. And so I'm working to put on the best event for them. And it's it's going to be phenomenal. I mean, we're going to have amazing speakers and the quality of participants is incredible. So there's so many super money savvy people that are very supportive and generous with their time and helpful. And so, you know, just like when I go to Economy or Camp Buy or Fin Talks, any of these events or Camp Mustache You know, I learn a lot from the speakers, but I learn just as much from the participants. And then we're going to have adventures in Bali together and (laughs) do lots of cultural stuff. And then we're going to hang out afterwards and have some fun time, you know, at the beach, even after it ends, just hanging out, getting to know each other. So there is a lot of value in those small conversations that we'll have um, and that we have at all of these events. So if your listeners haven't gone to a campfire, a economy or a fin talks or a camp mustache, you know, or they want to come to Bali by freedom, I would recommend it. There's something special, especially about a multi-day event. The second day, something special really happens. And um, those relationships go really deep. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree, would echo that significantly. I think I've been to probably six or seven, not quite as many as you, but I, I'm getting close. Yeah, there's just something really special about it. So we'll have all of those links to all the events that you mentioned in the in the show notes. But I guess for people, you're going to have this in all likelihood every single year. So it looks like I'm on your website now. If you go way to the bottom, bottom right, you can sign up for a mailing list. So I'm assuming those people will be the first to find out about the 2024 event. Yeah. And I would recommend to get on the mailing list because it will, I, I anticipate, will sell out fast again. So that way they can be the first to know. And I would love to welcome them to Bali. Yeah, that sounds so cool. And uh, yeah, maybe I can convince my wife and uh, we we can join you in 2024. That would be awesome. Oh, I would love it. I would love it. Yeah, that would be great. So just one last thing I wanted to talk about it since we, we mentioned very much in passing a couple of these gap years that you took. And I know you've mentioned before that that it's something you really believe in and that you think a lot more people should consider. Now, we, we've talked about a lot of these these important kind of, hey, maybe have this aha moment. And I think a gap year is something that most people don't really consider because they think about what is it going to look like on my resume or all these other ridiculous things, Like, which, I mean, they're not ridiculous, of course. But how would you respond to that to somebody who has these normal fears? And I, I don't mean to make light of them, of course, but these very normal fears about taking that time off, about having, like you said, you even had imposter syndrome, right? From taking two years off of teaching. So, I mean, you very viscerally know what that's like to have these legitimate fears. And again, I was kidding before, but talk me through that and the power and value of gap years. I think it speaks to what we were saying before about, you know, what if it's better? You know, you just never know what could happen in a gap year. You know, you don't know what you don't know. So um, I took my first gap year in 2005 when I left Japan and I traveled around Southeast Asia and India and Europe. And in that year, I met someone who was an international school teacher. And I wasn't actually sure I was going to go to international school teaching. And that was a life-changing moment for me. And then coming to Bali and, you know, healing, I would have never anticipated like healing my relationship with my father and being able to meet someone in Bali. I didn't even want to live in Bali because I didn't imagine <laughs> that would be a good place to meet someone, but I was wrong, you know. And then I started a business in Bali with someone I met there. So, you know, you just never know when you take time to really deeply reflect on your life and get clear about your values in a way that's hard to do if you only have, you know, a couple of weeks off a year, you know, on the weekends, you're just doing life admin. I am at least taking some time for yourself and really getting clear about your values. And I would recommend, honestly, slow travel and being Because you can gap year and you can go a lot of places really quickly and you're just constantly trying to figure out how do I get to the next place where I'm going to stay logistics. But if you allow yourself to kind of use that time, I would say intentionally to reflect, to do some meditation retreats, maybe do a 10 day silent retreat or stay in one place, have routine, meeting people, going deep with people, the community that you will meet and the opportunities that you have, it's something that you can't even anticipate. And it may save you years on your life. 
because you may have some realizations that it would have, at least for me, it would have taken me years and years to figure out. And maybe I wouldn't have never, never figured them out until, you know, I'm on my deathbed with some regrets or something like that. But I would highly recommend. And I guess if listeners don't feel like they can take a full year, you know, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. You know, there is a lot of value even taking six months or two months, but taking some time to really reflect and and doing it in an intentional way. Yeah, it's amazing how these themes keep recurring on Choose of I across so many of our guests of slow travel, of having a routine, of not try. I mean, it sounds obvious when you when you hear it, like not traveling to check boxes, right? But that's easy to say now, but I think that's how so many of us travel, right? Is oh, I visited Italy, I visited France, and yeah, maybe I was there for a day or two, but is that really visiting? Is that really experiencing the culture? Is that really getting to know the city, the town, the country, the people? Probably not, if you're honest. And and that's the kind of travel that I've done to a large degree. And I think really living somewhere of getting to feel the heartbeat of that city or that town and understanding how people live, there's just so much value to that. And I think that has become just so much more appealing to me as I've learned more about myself, about the world, and what I value from my day-to-day life. And yeah, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting, interesting thing. And I love the intersection there, as you're describing, of this gap year and slow travel. And I think people, that's yet another thing that I hope people are leaving from this episode with just being mindful of. It's something to consider. And like you just said, because so many of us do fall back into our old type A, oh, I have to check boxes, it doesn't have to be a year. It's called a gap year, but it doesn't have to be a (laughs) year, right? Like it can be a gap month or a gap two months. I mean, of course, in theory, the longer the better, but don't beat yourself up. I think that's, Amy, if I could put words in your mouth, I think that's what we both would say to people is don't beat yourself up about something that, that you can't control. You're just, you're trying to do the best you can. You're trying to learn and you're trying to grow. Yeah, I guess the other thing I would say about a gap year or a gap six months or whatever is it allows you to try on, you know, your retirement. So I wouldn't have realized, you know, like I said, I went to Bali a dozen times as a tourist and maybe I spent there 10 days at a time max each time, but it wasn't really till I lived there that I saw, you know, their whole different side of it. So, you know, if listeners have an idea of what their, you know, ideal post fi life looks like, try that out for a little while and see how much they like it. And you know, that may give them other ideas or they may meet someone and it may lead them on a whole other path. But definitely there's a lot of learning through that process. Indeed, indeed. Amy, thank you so very much for coming on. It was lovely to talk to you. I think I can certainly say with confidence that people enjoyed this episode. And I'd love to have you back on someday for certain. And maybe I'll see you in Bali in 2024. But if people are looking to get in touch with you, find out more, how can they reach out to you? Sure. They can go to uh, the footer on my contact page, get on the mailing list, but they can reach out to me directly if they click on the contact page and there's a form there that they can fill out and reach out to me directly. And they're welcome to ask any questions that they've got questions about Bali or Southeast Asia. I've lived in the region since 2001, so I'm happy to give advice about other places as well. And, you know, I will be at uh, Camp Fi in January and March next year and economy again. So I hope to meet people in person at those events as well. And thank you so much for having me on. You know, your your podcast made such a difference in my life. And I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing and for creating financial literacy and freedom for people in the world. It's transformational. It was for me. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate it. And yeah, it's been wonderful getting to know you. And uh, again, thanks for coming on. So right, if people are looking to reach out, so it's fivefreedomretreats, plural, dot com, fivefreedomretreats.com. Yes. Thank you. You got it. (laughs) All right, Amy. Thanks again. Thank you.